Today's message is the day of Pentecost. And those of you online, thank you for joining us. Make sure you like this video and share it with your friends so that they can hear the word of God as well. We're going to be discussing what happened at Pentecost. Now that Pentecost is actually tomorrow, uh, we want to be, and those of you watching this, it might have already passed or it might be the day of Pentecost. But either way, we want to discuss Pentecost in this season. And we quickly went over this last week. Pentecost is uh, a Greek word. It means 50 days. So 50 days after the resurrection or after the Feast of First Fruits comes the Feast of Weeks. And that's, in the Jewish sense, the Feast of Weeks is seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection. And God foreordained all these feasts, and Jesus aligned with all of them. And here's what's cool about the feasts. There are fall feasts that are not fulfilled. So all the spring feasts had their fulfillment in Jesus' first coming. The fall feasts have not been fulfilled, which is um, trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles. So there's three feasts remaining. And in fact, in Zechariah, he prophesies the millennial kingdom. And he says that we'll be keeping tabernacles, even making sacrifices at the temple. So it's a new dispensation during Jesus's reign on earth. And we're not making sacrifices for sin, but we're doing the same things that, that Abel did, that Abraham did, that everybody did. They made sacrifices unto God in gratitude. And then typically, especially in Acts 2 and Acts 4, the temple or the church then shares those sacrifices with those that are in need. So very cool. So these last day feasts have not been fulfilled, but these early ones have been. And Pentecost is one of those that has been fulfilled. And so as we talk about Pentecost, understand that we're actually living in this age right now. We're actually in this age of Pentecost. We're in the new covenant. We're going to read where Peter actually quotes the prophets regarding Pentecost coming and what that means. Now, here's something that's really cool. If you didn't watch the first one or you didn't hear the first message, Moses received the Ten Commandments on the same day. The Feast of Weeks day was when Moses received the Ten Commandments. We received then the law of the Spirit on the same day. And Paul goes into this in detail in Romans, but that there is the law written on stone, the written law, and then there's the law written on our hearts. And that one comes by the Spirit. Now, people get confused because there's a there's crossover among these laws. But the quickest way that I made it make sense last week is murder was wrong for Cain. And then Moses adopted that murder was wrong and murder remains wrong in the new covenant. And so you can have different ages in the Bible and yet have very similar or even the same laws because it's all the same God. Does that make sense? If it does say amen. All right. So what happened at Pentecost? What is Pentecost all about? Well, let's read Acts chapter two so we can see the day of Pentecost. Everybody say the day of Pentecost. Day of Pentecost. All right. So when the day of Pentecost had come, which is tomorrow, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, the disciples. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. In this case, this was the supernatural speaking of other earthly languages. There is tongues of angels. We'll discuss that in a minute. But here, they're supernaturally speaking foreign languages. That's what that's what happens. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing uh, them speak in his own language. So there's the proof of what I was saying, that they were hearing their languages being spoken by the disciples. So you imagine during this feast season, the Feast of Weeks is a Jewish feast. I know that Christians essentially keep two feasts. They keep Resurrection Day, which is the Feast of First Fruits, and they keep Pentecost. We should be keeping all of them, but thankfully the Christians still can't escape two of them because they're so obviously Jesus. Of course, all of them are Jesus. So all the Jews are in Jerusalem and they're celebrating the Feast of Weeks. They're meant to be there. It's like Passover. They're supposed to be there. So you have different tribes, different tongues, different nations, because people could join Judaism even from other nations. People sometimes forget that, that even in the law of Moses, a foreigner could get circumcised and begin to observe. And even today, Jewish rabbis will circumcise and allow someone to actually join or Orthodox Judaism. 
So you've got all these nationalities in the crowd and they're speaking a bunch of different languages. And they're saying, we're hearing this in our tongue. And what they were saying was the gospel. They started to preach the gospel in these tongues. And it was an incredible occurrence. And rightly so, it says in verse 7, they were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? In other words, aren't these Galileans? How do they know all these languages? These aren't learned men. These are not you know, educators. These are not professors. These are not rabbis. These are regular fishermen for the most part. And they're speaking our languages. How can they? Typically, an intelligent person, one of the signs of their intelligence is, of course, academic knowledge. But a lot of times these people speak multiple languages, right? And you can tell like, oh, you're, you're pretty, you have a sound mind if you can speak five languages, right? That was happening supernaturally. So they were surprised. Verse eight. And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? <laughs> Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews, Jews and proselytes, meaning people who had become Jews, which is what I was mentioning earlier. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Now, this tells you something about the gospel. Jesus wants the gospel to go out to every nation. This is not just for the Jewish people. This is for all people because all have descended from Adam, all have sinned, and all are saved through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's good news. God's not a racist. Praise God. I'm serious, right? Racism in the world comes from the devil. It doesn't come from God. God is reaching all races here. How many, how many races did we just list? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 12, 13, 14, the Romans, 15, 16. We got 16 different people groups listed here. Does that tell you something about God? And I bet there were even more. I think the scriptures make the point. You don't have to list every people group on earth. God wants them to hear the gospel. And notice that the gifts are being used not for the benefit of the person operating in them, but for the receiver, because God loves them, right? A lot of times people start to operate in an anointing and they can start to misuse that anointing. And God will keep working through them. You know that the scriptures say that for God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. Okay, so people can be anointed and still be doing wrong things. And it's okay to rebuke those wrong things, but also appreciate the anointing. I think maybe the strongest example of this that I've recently studied is Elisha. Elisha receives a double portion of anointing that Elijah had. And then you could argue that when he called out those bears to maul a bunch of kids because they made fun of his bald head, that he acted on his own in the name of God, but on his own. And sadly, Elisha, this is very bizarre and not normal, even in the Old Covenant. Elisha, in his anointing, dies of sickness. Very odd. And even after his death, his bones resurrect a dead man when the dead man falls onto his bones. God's gifts and callings are irrevocable, but I believe this is a warning for ministers like me and any Christian. We need to pay attention that an anointing is a gift and you are not suddenly some hotshot. And Paul made this point too. There were those who considered themselves super apostles. And he said, I'm the worst of all sinners and least of all saints. That was his attitude. That's the humble attitude God expects from his servants. Jesus said, we should say we are just unworthy slaves. <laughs> Right. We know that he's called us adopted sons and daughters and that he has loved us. But let him praise you. Don't praise yourself. Does that make sense? Let him honor you. Don't honor yourself. This is important. OK, so they're reaching all these people groups. God has given them an anointing. This is an incredible moment. Verse 12. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. I love that the word includes that, that you've got people who are, they're perplexed no matter what. I mean, even people who believe it are perplexed and they're like, what's going on here? Which is the fulfillment of scripture, which Peter's about to share. He's about to preach the gospel for the first time after the receiving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. This is really cool. But they're full of sweet wine, <laughs> which is what people say nowadays, especially about folks who are operating the gifts. They must be drunk, a bunch of, bunch of wild drunks. All right. Acts chapter two, verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, 
Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. Everybody say, give heed heed. to my words. words. Now, whether we realize it or not, it's the Holy Spirit that is about to speak through Peter. I think that's obvious. We just had the Pentecostal experience where they're speaking in new tongues. But he says, give heed to my words. And this is God's message all the time. Listen to my word. Listen to my word. Hear what I have to say, because my words are life and they are health. That's what Proverbs 4 says, right? My son, hear my words. Listen to my words. Keep them in your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health unto all their flesh. So hear my words. That's the first thing Peter says. That's the first thing God says through Peter in the new covenant right where it begins. Wow. Verse 15. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose. So (laughs) the Lord immediately starts to correct false doctrine. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose. For it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. Everybody say all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit. Now, it's funny. Our modern translations don't want it to say bond slaves. We don't like that term. But the truth is, that's who serves God. Paul said, I am a slave of God. So the bond slaves, why are we bond slaves? Well, because freely Jesus has given us mercy and forgiveness. And so now we're indebted to him. Not that we can earn the salvation. That's not what this indebtedness is. But out of gratitude for what he's done for us, we are now bond slaves of the Lord. And believe you me, you used to be a slave of sin anyways. So I'd prefer slavery to the good God who gives all his good and perfect gifts to me, forgives me of all sin, pours his spirit on me, gives me long life, gives me eternal life, right? It's a much better deal. But the idea behind serving God is still that we're bond slaves, sons and daughters and bond slaves. Both realities are true. Okay, so even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Everybody say shall prophesy. Now, a lot of times people think that prophesy means just speaking future events, right? That's prophecy. Prophesy is actually a different word. Prophesy includes all kinds of things. It includes prophecy, But it also includes words of knowledge and teachings and a number of other things, which we'll see in Corinthians. So when he says on my sons and daughter, they shall prophesy, it means that they will speak my words, both groups. Okay, this and here's why this is a big deal in the Levitical priesthood, which has been enacted for the last couple thousand years in the Levitical priesthood, only men served in the temple. This was God's will and God's law. There were no female priestesses. Okay, Isaiah had married a prophetess as a prophet, but the priests, which were different from the prophets, the priests who served in the temple and who essentially taught the word of God, which prophets did too. There's some overlap there, but they did the temple sacrifices. They did the service. They're the ones who entered the Holy of Holies, not the prophets. The high priest entered. These were only men. Everybody say only men. men. All right. So everybody gets confused there. Because that's how things worked in the previous age. But we are in what's called a new covenant, a new agreement, a new age. And the prophet Joel, which Peter is quoting by the Holy Spirit, says that now those who serve in my house are sons and daughters. Both prophesy. And prophesy is not just future events. Prophesy is all kinds of stuff, which we'll look at. Okay? So that's good news. Everybody say good news. news. It is good news because before the fall, woman was given to man as a good gift. In fact, listen, before this fall, before the devil got into marriages and into male and female relationships and all that, before he got in, God saw that Adam being alone was not good. It's the first time he said something was not good. Do you realize that the first time God says something is not good, it's before the fall of man. It's before sin has even entered. It was Adam's loneliness and God's good gift to him was Eve. 
Eve was not a sinner at creation, just like Adam was not a sinner, right? And so, yeah, there was this whole, yeah, he shall rule over you. The men are going to run the church, all the things. That was all a result of the fall. Do you understand? But the original design was that Eve was a co-heir with Christ. That's what scripture says. And now that restoration comes in the new covenant where now the spirit is poured out on the daughters as well as the sons and the daughters prophesy, which I will talk about more. But it's important to see that it must be pretty important for the Holy Spirit to make it one of the first topics that Peter discusses. Do You understand? First, he says we're not drunk. And then he essentially says the spirit's being poured out on all flesh. Male and females. That's the first thing God wanted you and I to know at Pentecost. Why would I preach on the gifts of the Spirit first when the first thing actually is that the Spirit's being poured out on both? They didn't even understand the gifts yet. Right? They just, uh, okay. Both male and female servants are suddenly speaking in foreign languages. And there were tongues of fire that rested on them. They don't doctrinally understand that yet. Okay? They will, but they don't yet. But here's what Peter gets. Well, both male and female will have the spirit port. The spirit's going to do all sorts of exciting and amazing things. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Verse 19. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. Now, that's when Jesus is returned. And it's a big deal. So he goes from spirit poured out until, notice, okay, before the great and glorious day of the Lord. This covenant exists all the way to Jesus' return. I do believe we actually enter into a new covenant at that point, a different one, again. And that's not bizarre. Adam was in, a, in an age that applied to only him, represented, or that, that time period, represented by he was only allowed to eat vegetables. He could not eat meat. That was its own age. There were other things, but that was its own age, the Edenic age. Then you have that, the, the Noahide age, Noah is told in Genesis 9, you can eat all moving creatures. That's different from Adam. These are two different ages. Then you have uh, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, which was circumcision entered, but you have the law of Moses. Law of Moses makes very clear you cannot eat every moving creature. You can only eat what God indicates is clean and nothing that he indicates as unclean. And then in Acts, we enter into a new age. Sons and daughters prophesy, but even Acts goes into cleanliness and about food. Peter has a dream that God has cleansed all animals. And then God speaks to him and says, do not call unclean what I have made clean. And he uses animals because he has cleansed them to represent man. That man was unclean and has been made clean. And that's why they can associate with Jews because he was concerned about going to a Gentile to preach the gospel to him. And so God made the point, I can cleanse animals and men both at the same time. Don't call something unclean that I've made clean. And in fact, we testify to God's power of cleansing by eating the things that were formerly unclean. It's not an evil practice. Okay, so <laughs> there's where people get tripped up. Ages, they get tripped up on ages. And then this last days, this new covenant lasts until the temple. Can I tell you exactly how the new temple, this third temple is going to function with Jesus reigning in it? No, I know that Zacharias says we're all keeping tabernacles and we are making sacrifices in the temple, but they're fellowship offerings. They're different. They're not sin sacrifices. They're fellowship offerings. They're really similar to Abel. And if Abel was doing it well before a temple, it's not that bizarre to think that we're going to be doing it again. Right now, we still make sacrifices, prayers, gifts to the poor. That's what God said about Cornelius, that those were the equivalent of temple sacrifices and that they were a sweet aroma coming up to his nostrils that he delighted in. Remember in the temple, they would essentially cook meat at the temple and it always smelled good. They were baking bread, they were cooking meat. Well, now that good smell comes from prayers and gifts to the poor, according to God. In the next, in the next age, I, I, I'm of a mind that while Jesus is reigning, there won't be poor. So I think that it's going to be different again. Does that make sense? All the poverty is being relieved. We're not, nobody's going to go hungry in Jesus's kingdom. And so there's a different form of sacrifice that's taking place at that time. That's a personal opinion, but it's based off of Zechariah. Okay. Now, this is the day of the Lord that comes next, verse 21. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This whole time leading up to Jesus' return, you can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And it's been 2,000 years of it. 
Praise God. And I praise God for every evangelist and every person who has ever spoken the word of God to other people. Because salvation comes by hearing the word, hearing the message about Christ, which Peter is about to share. He's saying, listen, here's what the prophet Joel said. This age has started. This is no longer the Mosaic age. This is now the new covenant that was prophesied in Jeremiah and in Joel. Those are the two prophets that talked about this covenant. Okay. And look, Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to these words. Look, there he is. Hear the word. Everybody say, hear the word. word. We want to hear the word. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man arrested, attested to you by God with miracles. Sorry, I apologize. A man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. They knew that his miracles were verified because he would send. You wonder why he sent people to the priests almost every time. Not every time, but a lot of times. That was considered the the evidence that would go on record. Yep. And that's why they were so frustrated when he would heal people. They'd call for parents and other witnesses. They wanted as many proofs that it didn't happen as possible. And every one of them would testify that it did happen. And it was just very frustrating for them. So he's appealing to that. You know he did miracles and you crucified him. Isn't that interesting? He did real bona fide miracles, not some sort of gimmicky magician nonsense. Verse 23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. There's the sovereignty of God at work. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. In other words, God predestined foreknowing you. Notice he says both predetermined and foreknowledge. He predestined you through God's foreknowledge to have crucified him. He knew you would. He sent him at exactly the time where he knew you would. You're still responsible. You did it. He just knew you would. And he set it all up in advance. Wow. God, (laughs) he exists at a level we don't exist at, right? I think this is why it's so silly for us to try and play the predestination game of you're predestined, you're predestined, you're, you know, for for this or for that, because God has foreknowledge that none of us have. Okay, so he has this understanding that none of us have. So as long as we try and play the Calvinist game of knowing everything and knowing, understanding fully predestination, we're just going to end up falling on our face because only he has that kind of knowledge. We're actively in the present. We don't know who's saved and who's not. We preach the gospel. We heal the sick. We drive out demons. We help the poor. We evangelize. We do what God has said to. We don't try and sit around and go, well, it's all in God's hands and he'll take care of it. Right? Right? He's working through you. You are the hands and feet. You are the body of Christ. Says that Christ is the head. You are the body. He's making the decisions and running the show. And you are in submission, right? Does your body do what you want it to do? Yeah. Yeah. If I want to move my arms, if I want to clap, it's going to do what the head tells it to do. That's the idea of the body and the head. So we're the body going and doing what Jesus wants. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, (laughs) putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. In other words, the power of death was not strong enough to keep Christ in the grave. One, because he's the word of God made flesh, the son of God, and is God himself. Now, that might all confuse you a little bit. I'll make that make sense. You are made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. This is what we mean when we say Jesus is the word. Jesus is uh, Lord. Jesus is the son. And then we go all the way and we say Jesus is God. How could we say that? In addition, this is something that the Muslims trip over. Some of the Jews trip over. Okay, you're made in God's image, right? What are you? You are spirit. You are mind. You are body. Right. And Paul verifies this in Romans. He says the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the body or the flesh is death, sin and death. Okay, you're made in God's image. You are three in one. You are three in one in in unity together. Now, the three can fight each other. The father, son and spirit never fight each other. They're in perfect unity. But you are in a form of unity, a fallen state, but a form of unity where your spirit, your soul or your mind and your body are unified in one. And you bear God's image and you bear his nature in that regard. Not sin is not his nature, but you do bear his Trinitarian nature of being three in one. So this is what we mean when we say that Jesus is God. It's just like you three in one. Not not we can talk about it more but that's not as big of a deal as people make it out to be. 
The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one, just like you, mind, body, and spirit are one. Amen. Does that make sense? Some sense? Maybe you've never heard the Trinity explained that way. I know I sure didn't. People always told me like, well, it's like water. It's like an egg or it's like a tree roots and then the stump and then the branches. And I think that just use a person made in God's image is the very best image we could use for how God functions. Okay. (laughs) And still he's transcendent. So that doesn't even perfectly describe it, but at least it gets us started. But God raised him up again. Everybody say hallelujah. 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 God raised Jesus from the dead. He couldn't be held down because he, God is love. Jesus is God. Love overwhelms sin, overwhelms it. The power that God possesses is the love, the love for his creatures. Love is powerful, folks. And he loves us. And love defeats death and sickness and sin. Love. So powerful. For David says of him, verse 25, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue exulted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. And hope is confident expectation. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, praise God, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the way of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. That is what happened to Jesus. David was actually prophesying Jesus. Verse 29, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Right? Peter's immediate point is David's not talking about himself here. And so because he was a prophet, and knew what God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. You know he resurrected. He walked around for 40 days. He appeared to over 500 of you in addition to us. You know God raised him from the dead. Verse 33, therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Here's where we get the oneness of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You have even David and Jesus quoted David here because this doesn't make sense in the natural. The Lord said to my Lord, what does that even mean? David is the king, as far as the earth is concerned, a king of kings, right? He's top dog. He doesn't have anybody over him. The Lord said to my Lord, my Lord, what do you, the Lord and your, and he's talking about the father and the son and the spirit. Seriously. Seriously. The Holy Spirit has to reveal these things. Hence why he's talking about these things when the Holy Spirit's been given. That's what it takes to understand these mysteries that people didn't understand for a very long time. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, which means Messiah. This Jesus whom you crucified. Another proof of who Jesus is, is God says in the prophets, the Father says in the prophets, I alone am Savior. No Savior apart from me. So when Jesus is called Savior, the angel, the Savior, the Messiah, and then of course affirmed here, Savior, Christ, Messiah. Again, Jesus is God. It's an important concept to understand. The Lord said to my Lord, Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent. Everybody say repent. Repent. Here you go. What's your first step? What's your first step coming to God? Believe that he exists. Yep. Like Hebrews says, believe that he exists. You can't even repent if you don't think he's there. Believe that he exists. Then he rewards those who seek him. What's the reward? Well, that when you repent, he'll forgive you. So repent is step one, folks. Repent. Change your mind. Believe what God has said about his son and everything his son has said about himself and about the father. And believe the spirit now speaking through people. Now, don't misunderstand me. Spirit of God speaks through people today. 
just as much as right here the Spirit is speaking through Peter. Thankfully, we have the written word. We can verify a spirit to know where they're coming from. Because people throughout history have had encounters with angels, white-robed angels. And the scriptures say that Satan can appear as an angel of light. Satan can speak. Satan can send ideas to your mind. So how do we stay out of that? We've got to be in the written word so we know when the spoken word of God is actually coming from God or is being spoken to our mind and our heart. Do you understand? And you'll get more discerning over time, but especially at the beginning and throughout all time, you should be in the written word so that you know when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you because the Holy Spirit will not reject his own word. Do you understand? And if there's confusion, it's on our end, not on his end. Just like the ages thing I talked about, a lot of people trip on the ages in the Bible. The Holy Spirit has no problem explaining that to a person if we'll just stop being arrogant and we'll just listen. Oh, okay, I see the difference between Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, New Covenant, last days. I see it. It's there. Okay, same God, different agreement with men at different times. Okay, thank you, Holy Spirit. And so you see it in the Word, and the Holy Spirit teaches it to you. Do you understand? His name is the helper, Jesus said, or the teacher. I teach you all things. Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent. Change your mind. Start to believe this Jesus whom you crucified. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What that means is when you've changed your mind and you start to believe Jesus, you then are to be baptized with water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, Jesus said, or in the name of Jesus Christ. Peter says here, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what that represents. It's death and cleansing into new life. The old you goes away. The new you begins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I believe every, and not everybody thinks this, but I believe every Christian does receive the Holy Spirit at that point. Baptism of the Holy Spirit or a stirring of the gifts is actually a different occurrence, yeah, same spirit. which we'll talk about. But I do believe that people are saved when they've been baptized by water in the name of Jesus Christ. So we are not among those. There are some Pentecostals and Charismatics that make the case that people aren't even saved if they haven't had the gifts stirred in them. I don't think that the Bible makes that case. Okay. I think that's proven actually by when Paul encountered some baptized believers who hadn't yet received the gifts. Didn't mean they weren't Christians. And we'll, we'll read that. That's part of my text today. All right. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. It's the same message today. Yep. Perversion in the earth, very normal, par for the course, nothing new under the sun. Right? Heterosexual sin, homosexual sin, greed, bitterness, mistreating your neighbors, poverty, all these evil things that are taking place in the earth. Liars with power. Liars with power. All of that. Nothing new. I mean, we're talking about Rome here. We're talking about Rome and then Jerusalem, which Rome owns at, at the time. This is a corrupt society. This is Babylon. The United States is very Babylonian. And so he says, be saved from this perverse generation. It's the same message. We're not trying to be relevant. We're not trying to fit in. We're saying, now come out of this perversity. Come out of all this. Repent. Receive forgiveness from all this nonsense that people are doing that's bringing wrath on them. Repent and believe on Jesus Christ and obey Jesus Christ as Lord. That's the message. It's not changed. I'm not trying to make things relevant. I'm trying to pull you into a different kingdom. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to like make our kingdom fit. It's two different kingdoms. In one of them, do as thou wilt. And in the other one, do as God wills. It's two different kingdoms. There is no mixing of these kingdoms. You cannot fellowship with Christ and Belial or Belial. Light and darkness have no fellowship with each other. Come out of this perverse generation. Same message today. I don't know why Christians wouldn't read the book of Acts. It's so bizarre to me. Verse 41. So then, those who had received his word... Whose word? It wasn't Peter's word. God's word were baptized. And that day, 
there were added about 3,000 souls. So baptism is still very important. I believe that the thief on the cross was saved, of course, by faith. It is by faith. It's not by works. If we make baptism a requirement, baptism is a work. So clearly it's not part of salvation, but it is a follow-up to salvation. It's really your first practice run at obeying God. You know how people like really don't like to get rained on or be in water? It's like, come on down to the river and we're going to dunk you. <laughs> we're going we're to start with a little bit of discomfort. Doesn't matter if it's cold. Doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's get dunked. <laughs> and it represents, it's not about that. It's about cleansing and a new life. The old you dies and is cleansed. New you comes to life. New creature in Christ Jesus. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were about 3,000 souls added to the kingdom from one sermon. <laughs> Peter, come on. Let's, let's start preaching like Peter. 3,000 people get saved when you preach like Peter. Hallelujah. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place to the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. I believe that this is directly tied to the teaching of Jesus when he said, if you cannot be trusted with worldly wealth, who will give you heavenly riches? This church operated in power and the true church on earth today operates in power and God will confirm the message by power and by miracles if you are trustworthy with worldly power. And worldly power is money. You and I both know it. That worldly power is money. It's just paper, but it has the power to change people's lives. Literally, it does. And I'm not calling, I'm calling it the weakest of powers, but it is a power, is it not? Yeah. It has the power to change people's lives. It has the power to build giant buildings. It has a lot of power. Nothing compared to God's spirit. Money cannot raise the dead. So you see the difference in the powers. But I'll tell you, this is the test that the Lord gave me last, last week at Ponce Church. I believe it came from the Lord, and I'm going to repeat it here because he's reminded me of it. If you really want to lay hands on little cancer babies and see that cancer leave, then you better be giving to hospitals that are serving children with cancer already. See, because if you're not being trustworthy with worldly power and wealth, he's not going to bestow heavenly power and wealth on you. Because you'll use it for you and you'll build yourself up just the same way you are with money. You, your money is the test of whether you can walk in the gifts or not. That don't come from me. That's not my theology. You understand? God's will is for those little babies to be healed. Prove that it's genuinely your will by using the power you do have to assist them. See, they're helping the poor, which would include the sick and a number of other groups, with the power they have. The whole church hasn't necessarily received the gifts yet. That happens later. They all pray as a group. The building shakes, and they're all given the gifts, which also proves that people are saved before the gifts are stirred. It's not until they pray later in Acts that the big group gets the gifts. And that's because the big group is doing this. Notice what it said? And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them all as anyone might have need. They began. The equivalent of that today is giving your money to St. Jude's because you want the little babies healed. Then God will move through your faith to heal the little babies when you lay hands on them. Now, can God spontaneously heal people? Yes. Will he heal them through his word? Yes. We're talking about you. We're talking about you personally, your faith bringing the healing. I know a person themselves can have faith. But do you realize when Peter, his shadow would pass over, it would heal them? Okay, listen, Peter walked in faith himself. The woman, or I'm sorry, not the woman, the man who was at the temple and he was paralyzed, who Jesus raises up and lifts up, he barely says anything to that man. All he says is, silver and gold have I none. What I do have, I give to you. This was Peter's faith acting. It wasn't even the recipient's faith in that case. There's multiple kinds of healing in the Bible. 
Okay? In this case, this was Peter's faith acting. There are other places where it says, according to your faith, be it done unto you. And what I'm saying is, with the, with the worldly wealth, if you're not trustworthy with that, how are you going to get trustworthy with this supernatural power? Whatever you're doing with your money is what you'll do with other power, too. So if your money is to build you up, imagine raising the dead. Okay? Man, people are going to be, they're going to look at you. They're going to be real surprised. And you have an opportunity there to kind of exalt yourself as a God. You do. And if you're already living like you're a God with your money, you you do it with that power too. I'm telling you, help those little babies. Give to the poor. Then you'll be trustworthy with true riches. All, everybody say all. All All the apostles were trustworthy with worldly wealth, except Judas. Judas was stealing from the gifts to the poor. All of them were trustworthy. Barnabas, who gets saved later, sells his stuff, gives it all to the poor. And then he's enabled to do the same miracles Paul's doing. I'm telling you, there's something here. Now, are people still being healed? Yeah, they are being healed. God will heal people when they have faith in his word. I'm talking to you personally. When you lay hands on the sick, by your faith, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Your prayer of faith becomes powerful and effective the more you use the worldly wealth to help people. Use that power that you do have. It proves, does it not? It proves if you're taking this power that you do have, if you can help pay for the medical care, that you do want these sick children and people well. Doesn't it prove that? It does. And if you're not doing it and you have the power to do it, you're not going to do it if you are given the gifts in great measure. I know it's convicting, but it's right here. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them all as anyone might have need. I'm just telling you, this is a huge key to walking in the power of God is sharing what you have, the power you do have. Prove yourself worthy of greater power. Prove yourself worthy to the king. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Everybody say, day by day. Day by day. They were in the word day by day. They were fellowshipping day by day. They gathered in the temple courts day by day. They weren't like, oh no, we got church today. Ah, only attending one time. These folks were enthusiastic. They were there every day because they knew the word was life and health to their body. And then as they heard the word, naturally you're going to hear about money and the poor and helping people and loving your neighbor. So then they got eager to do that too and began selling. And then not long after, they were all enabled to do miracles, not just the apostles. The whole church, I'm telling you, they prayed. You read the book of Acts. They all prayed Together, God, enable your servants to do signs, wonders, and miracles and confirm the message. And the whole building shook and every one of them was enabled to heal. So this was not, not just heal, but all sorts of miracles. This was not just bestowed on the 12th. This was bestowed on the whole church. This is important to understand. The whole church started acting like the 12th and they became worthy of the gifts. And remember, the gifts are different. The gifts are different. Salvation comes by faith. The gifts, yes, you must believe in the gifts, but you, there are, there, you must be trustworthy with worldly wealth. So there is an action tied to the gifts. Some people don't realize that. Now you know. Amen. So ask God, God, what would you have me do? And then, of course, Peter heals. Let's read Jeremiah 31. Um, well, you know what? Because I quoted this, we'll go to Jeremiah 31. Let's just read Acts, Acts 3, the beginning of it. Starting from verse one, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold. Let's pause there. 
What's that say about Peter and John? They were giving. Yep. We've been given so much we don't even have any more to give. Yep. That's right. Peter left his nets and his business. He left a lot of material goods behind. You have to understand when you read Peter's story, he might have been a fisherman, but he wasn't poor. I know the chosen makes him poor. You're not poor when you're running a business. Okay. This was a man of some means and he left it. <laughs> and by this point, he's got nothing. I don't even have, I don't have a dollar in my pocket, buddy. We're just walking by the spirit of God and his provision. I've watched him turn fish and loaves. Jesus also, when he appeared to him, had some fish and loaves just on the beach there. So Peter's like, God will provide. Amen. He's gone. He's past that fear of not having money that most people are bound to. If I give it all, what's going to happen? Well, you need to read the word of God. You're never going to get over that fear if you don't read the word of God. What's going to happen is manna is going to rain. That's what's going to happen. You're going to receive everything you need while you're out preaching. Amen. So silver and gold have I none. He's giving it all away. He's trusting God for his provision. It's a good place to be as far as the scriptures are concerned. The world says, no, no, you need lots of assets and securities. Your security becomes God himself. When you make this dive, the securities are no longer the market. The security is God himself. That's right. And the market's not secure anyways. Amen. Thank you. How many times has it collapsed? Is Rome still here? How secure is their market? How secure will yours be? Just give it time. The only secure market is God's market. Amen. Invest in that one. <laughs> and you invest in that one by getting completely out of this one and giving. Now, I know not everybody's there. I'm talking about you have to read the word of God to get there. I'm just saying they got there by being in Jesus's word. And you'll know, you'll know, you'll just get that clear message. Sell. And you just do it. You just do it and you trust God. And don't let fear rule you. I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. <laughs> Peter is proving what I said a minute ago. Peter is clearly trustworthy with worldly wealth. So what does he have? Spiritual wealth. Just like Jesus taught. If you've not been trustworthy with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Here's a man, as an example to us, trustworthy with worldly wealth. And now he's being entrusted with true riches. And boy, you got to want that more than you want your assets and boats and money and bank accounts and interest rates and all the things. I get it. I've played in the stock market. I get it. I've had stocks that have gotten a 100% increase. Praise God. But I'm telling you, it's still nothing compared to the Spirit of God. Give that stuff. Increase comes from God. And it's to be given. Just like He gives us everything. So I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And I'm pointing something out. This is Peter's faith, not the man's faith. This is Peter's faith. There is a difference. I'll make the point, okay? Peter failed to heal in Matthew 17. Not quite walking in the faith that he's walking here. Not quite there yet. Jesus had the faith though, didn't he? Saved this, healed the same child that they failed. And this is important to understand too. As a child, the child wasn't spiritually responsible. It was either the parent or a priest that would be spiritually responsible to see him healed. So the other priests failed. Jesus didn't. The parent also said, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. So he was still struggling. Jesus healed. Okay, Peter does the same thing here. There are different kinds of healing in the Bible. Most of the time I'm teaching, and I believe it's biblical, the word of God heals. And that's the primary healing method in the scripture. But it is true that a minister of the gospel can have the faith and anointing to deliver the healing unto someone else. Even when they haven't even, he didn't take two hours to teach him faith, did he? Nope. It doesn't even, elsewhere, Jesus said it according to your faith to some people, not everybody. And then Paul, with a man that he told to rise up and walk, it says he saw his faith. But with this guy, we don't get any preaching. We only get, I don't have any money. What I do have, aka is faith and spiritual power. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. Praise God. 
With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. That's the right response to healing. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them. Hallelujah. Look at this, though. This is important to hear from Peter again. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the uh, so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power of piety we made him walk? I want to address this. I believe the Lord wants to address this. Peter has several things going on here. First, it's not, he's given up all of his money and stuff. So he's been enabled to operate in the spirit at this level, to raise paralyzed people. Okay, still God's will. Still God's will, whether it's happening or not. Clearly, Peter was enabled. That's one of the things. But here's the second deal. After doing it, he does not glorify himself. He does not start wearing a three-piece suit and making sure that everybody knows that he's a hot shot faith preacher. He does not go around flaunting anything. He says, why are you even looking at me at us? As though by our power. What does he say? Verse 13. And I like how he says power or piety. Whether he's like, no, I can't lift up a paralyzed person personally. It's God's power in me. It's not me. Secondly, it's not my piety either, which I so appreciate that. In other words, he's saying it's not because I've got it all figured out and I do everything perfectly. Not because of my righteousness, not because I've earned it by being a good enough and never sinning and all that. He might have become worthy because he did the right thing with money. But his point is, I'm not some sinless creature who never makes mistakes. It's not my power or my piety. Verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him, through him, has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. It's not my piety, it's not my power. I've put myself in a position to operate in this power because I've obeyed Jesus in this area and he's poured his spirit out on us and he wants to pour the same spirit out on you. You've got to recognize that you crucified him. You've got to repent of your sins and you've got to know that it's by faith in Jesus' name that all these things are done. And faith is confident expectation. It's being sure that it's done before you even see it. It's knowing that God's word is true regardless of what your eyes are seeing. Peter's eyes saw a paralyzed man. God's word was still true. You understand? It doesn't matter what the eyes are seeing. It's only what God's word says. It's only what Jesus has said. That's true. Jesus said in John 17, thy word or your word is truth. It's the only truth. Pilate didn't know the word of God, and it's why he said, what is truth? He just had no idea what it was. If you have the word of God dwelling in you, you'll know the truth and it'll make you free. It's faith in Jesus Christ, the word of God made flesh, who gave his life for us and resurrected. It's faith in him and his word and his promises and his power and his resurrection that brings forth the forgiveness of sin and the healing of the body. That is Peter's point. And the reason Peter is in a position that he can raise people is because he personally has given away everything to serve the Lord Jesus. Think about that. Meditate on that. 
Verse 17, and now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent. Everybody say repent. Repent. There it is again, talking to a new group. Change your mind. Believe what God has said. All of it. Don't just pick and choose doctrines. Genesis to Revelation, believe what he said. It's in there because it matters. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. And he continues on sharing the gospel. So what are the keys? Well, they've received the power of the Holy Spirit. The gifts were stirred in them. They're preaching the pure gospel. They're not trying to make it relevant. He said, come out of all the perversion. It's the world's perverted. Get out of it. Come into God's kingdom. Do as God will, not as thou will. They preach that pure gospel. They preach that Jesus did resurrect. Then they personally have become worthy of greater measure of power because of their generosity. Silver and gold have I none. And they're teaching the whole church to do it. It Says they began to sell possessions and give to the poor. And then the power of God was operating in them. Folks, we got to start to eagerly desire the gifts so much that money means nothing compared to seeing these little cancer patients totally healed when we lay hands on them. Do you understand? We got to want that more than we want the money. God's still willing, able, has promised everything, all of that. No sickness or disease can beat God. Jesus beat it all and he beat even death. So there's nothing that can stop God. The hindrance is us. It's always us. And even if we're believing, we may not be obeying. So really, I believe during this sermon, really consider that. The fact that Peter and the early church, they all were just constantly giving to the poor. Paul did it too. And they all operated in miracles. We're all greedy Americans who hold on to all of our money and we really do worship it. And we talk about all of our nice stuff that we own and we point to it and we compare it with other people's nice stuff. And we wonder why we're not seeing miracles. And I'm telling you, we're not like them. It's only when we become like the examples that we're going to see the same things. Okay. Now, I have seen miracles. I'm talking about regular miracles like they saw. It was like everybody's filled with the Spirit. Everybody's operating. If you want the whole church to have that level of power, then we've got to do this together. Yeah, there's going to be times where people have faith according to the Word, and they receive healing, and it happens, and it's real. But there's also a lot of this greed stuff that's hindering it. And Jesus said it would hinder it. And we see proven that when we stop it, the hindrance is gone. And you pick up paralyzed people. Amen. (laughs) Sounds good to me, Lord. All right. Now, Jeremiah 31. (laughs) I'm telling you, we're we're trading this wonderful inheritance for a bowl of soup. Money is a bowl of soup compared to the inheritance of God's power operating in a person and confirming the message. Okay, Jeremiah 31, uh, verses 31. Sorry, I should have just typed it in. Okay, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. says this, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Hello, not the Mosaic covenant, not like when I took them out of Egypt. I don't know why we seem to get caught up again in the Egyptian Mosaic covenant. That ended at the shedding of Christ's blood. Now, people are still born in the Mosaic law and the Mosaic covenant before Christ. So in that regard, yes, Jesus is right in Matthew 5. I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But the point is, it is fulfilled in him. You're right. You remain under the law of Moses before Christ. Paul makes that point. You get circumcised, you are obligated to obey the law of Moses, he said. So what's what's the deal? People are born under it, and Paul makes this point. They're born under it, and that the law is our schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. It's a guardian, it's a tutor, it's a teacher that takes us to Christ. You see how you failed to keep it, so you come to Jesus. That's the law's purpose. That's why it's not abolished right now. It's fulfilled in Christ. It's not abolished, and everyone's born under it. That's why it's still active. You can still point to the law of Moses when you're witnessing to people because that's what proves you need the Messiah. Then you enter a new covenant 
Everybody say new covenant. New covenant. It is not the same as the old. Just obey the word. I don't know why we got to fight over the Torah so much within the Christian household. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is a good new covenant. All sins are forgiven. Sons and daughters are all receiving the same spirit. We're not under the old covenant. Praise God. Because it was a yoke. It was a burden. It was a difficulty. Peter makes the point of it. Why would you want to put this yoke this burden on them that we have not been able to bear. He says that in Acts. Why would you put them under that? No, we're in a new covenant. The new covenant, yeah, the law is written on our hearts. We see it written in the New Testament. There are lots of the same laws. Doesn't the New Testament say don't murder just like the old covenant did? Yep, don't murder. New covenant. Now, what is the law of the Spirit? Because he talks about that. He says, hey, my Spirit will write the law. On their hearts. What's the law of the Spirit? Romans 7, 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Another way to translate that is we now serve by the Spirit and not by the written code. The old covenant received on the same day, Pentecost, Feast of Weeks. The old covenant was written on tablets of stone. The new covenant is written on human hearts. God directly is talking to us. He's not talking through Moses. He's talking directly because of what Jesus has done. It's a better covenant, isn't it? That's better that God will speak to you. He'll confirm it with his written word, but he'll speak to you directly. Good news. They didn't have this. They did not have this. How did God talk to Moses? Burning bush in the cloud on the mountain, you know, that's how God talked to Moses. Now we receive this still small voice. We all can hear from him through Jesus Christ. Oh, that's cool. That's good news. So it's not the old letter. Okay. If you're receiving something, say amen. amen. And then Galatians 5 goes over. People go, well, we're going to be lawless if we don't. No, that's not true. The Holy Spirit, like we see in Galatians 5, shows us exactly how to live now that we're in this new covenant. Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Amen. Oh, you're free from sin to do what now? Love and serve. Amen. Ah, you're no longer bound by constantly being consumed with yourself. You actually can care about other people in this Amen. new covenant. Good news. This is the gospel. It's good news. We, this, is, this, is, this is shout from the rooftop stuff. I'm telling you, the angels rejoice over this stuff. You, t- you should too. You've been set free from that sin and selfishness and just, oh, man, those days where you, all you can think about is your life and your stuff. God will release you from that. Now you can love others. Verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Praise God. That's in Leviticus. Verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Ooh, now we're getting into some of that Trinitarian theology that I talked about earlier. You have a mind, you have a body, you have a spirit. If you're led by the spirit, you will not sin with the body. See, this is how a person stops sinning. Okay, it's not by like beating yourself with a whip. It's by obeying God's word. And the only way you're going to obey God's word is if you're taking it in every day. And the Holy Spirit will lead you through that word to do what God has said. You'll be led by the spirit, not by your flesh. Verse 17. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. See, that war is what you're in before you start walking by the spirit. Verse 16. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. I want you to, if you're taking notes, go to John 8, or those of you watching, go to John 8 and read what Jesus says about freedom from sin. And he says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. You will know the truth 
by holding to his teaching and the truth will set you free. You'll be free from sin and you will walk in literal righteous living. You're not saved by that righteous living. You're made righteous as a gift, but you will actually walk in righteousness like what's been gifted to you. You will actually walk it out. And the way you walk it out is by holding to the teachings of Jesus. That's how you do it. Here's how you know if you're in the flesh. Verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality of various kinds. That can also be sexual immorality. Yeah, actually it should be translated sexual immorality. So the word is pornea, which is sexual immorality of all kinds. So the acts of the flesh are obvious. The first one he lists is sexual immorality. Pretty good indicator that you're in the flesh is that you're wanting to disobey God sexually. Even if you don't act it out, you want to. Pretty good idea that you're in the flesh. Okay, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. Idolatry is when you just worship a truck because it's lifted and has lights on it. That's literally modern idolatry. You worship a house because it's got a certain amount of square footage. That is idolatry. That is idolatry. God hates it in this covenant just like the old one. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. That's that spiritual... Witchcraft nonsense, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, we're in a new covenant. We're not under the old law. But if you notice, a bunch of those things listed are in the old law. That's how people get confused. But the Holy Spirit will confirm with you. Okay, Okay. yeah, meat has been cleansed. Great. Okay, you don't have to sacrifice a Passover lamb in the temple. There's not even a temple to do it in anymore. But you still aren't to be getting drunk. You still aren't supposed to live in sexual immorality. You're still not to practice sorcery. You're still not to be an idolater. You, you get what I'm saying? You're still not to be greedy. The Holy Spirit will lead you to not... You're not supposed to be this angry person, right? The anger was listed. Okay. And he says, I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are a sign you're in the flesh, not on your way to heaven. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. Amen. And love's a big one. Love has a lot. Of, you go read 1 Corinthians 13. Love, just that one word is a bunch of things. So love keeps no record of wrongs, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, right? Does, does, does not consider itself, but considers others. Love, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Boy, faithfulness is lacking in this country. I don't know about the whole church, but boy, we need to stick with what we say we're going to do. Whether that's ministry or something you told somebody else you would do. I, I feel the Lord wants us to know this. Business is not business in his eyes. He doesn't go, oh, that was business. Oh, it's just business. That's a phrase man made up. Two people interacting with each other is, is, is to be guided by God's spirit and his law. We don't get to say, well, it was business, and so, you know, I might have cheated him a bit. It was business, though. So. Nope. Repent. Business is people, and God is watching how we treat people. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there's no law. See, we're not lawless. We're not doing those evil things. We're doing these things. Verse 24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. How do you crucify it? You've got to be in his word and obeying what he says. And you will not walk by the, the flesh anymore. Verse 25, if we live by the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going we're gonna to wrap this up. But I know that Pentecost is tomorrow, and so I just want to make sure these points are made. Let's read Joel 2 so we can talk about the ladies real quick. I know I touched on it earlier. Just want to make that case, especially for those who are still with me watching the video. Thanks. Verse 28, Joel 2, 28. This is quoted in Acts 2 as well. Just want you to see it in the prophets, just like we looked at Jeremiah. It says this, It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Thanks be to God. Acts 2 confirms we're in those days right now. Praise God. Praise God. Now look at John 3.34. People go, well, the ladies can't do everything the guys can do. I just want to make a point real quick. John chapter 3, verse 34. 
Okay. So the Holy Spirit that Jesus had in him. This is what this says. John 3, 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Spirit of God was without measure in Jesus Christ. And the scriptures make the point that that same Spirit is poured into both male and female. And that that Spirit is without measure or without limit. The moment you tell a woman who's called of God that she can't teach because she's a woman, you now limit the spirit that has no limits. Thank you. And you misunderstand a few things. I don't have time to go into all the doctrine, but if you go into Timothy and you go into Corinthians, when we're dealing with, with the, the women keep silent in the churches, we are dealing with wives talking to their husbands across the aisle and Paul is saying, stop disrupting. And he tells the same women they can prophesy in the same letter. So clearly, he was not saying they have to just be silent. What he was saying was, if dad was sitting over here and my mom's over here and she's going, hey, Rick, hey, what do you think about what Rich just said? And I'm trying to preach. He's saying, be quiet, ladies. <laughs> ask your, and he literally says this afterwards, ask your husbands at home. I do the same thing. Teenagers disrupting the back. Be quiet, teenagers. Ask your parents at home. Do you get what I'm saying? He was addressing a problem. He wasn't saying women have to have their mouths shut in church. So that's the first one. Second one, Timothy. Okay, he says, he says that I suffer not a woman to teach. Okay. But then he says, women will be saved through childbearing in verse 15 of that passage. Okay. We are not encouraging women to just go pregnant willy-nilly. Get pregnant willy-nilly. That verse is talking to wives. He says, I suffer not a wife to teach or to assume authority over her husband. And I believe the reason he's even addressing that is they're in a town where there actually was a goddess temple in that city. You study this out where Timothy was. Uh, the temple of Artemis. I'm pretty sure it was the temple of, thank you, Lord. The temple of Artemis. And in that temple, women were the only ones allowed to be priests. This is important to understand. It wasn't men and women. It was just women. And they ruled over husbands. They literally did. They, they, that was part of what the temple Artemis was. The Artemis was God. And then women were therefore like goddesses. And they told men what to do. It wasn't this co-heir thing. It was ruling over. He's addressing that. I guarantee you he's addressing that. They also weren't thrilled about having babies. Which if you notice the spirit of feminism in the earth today. That Jezebel spirit. Not thrilled about having babies. Loves careers more than children. Loves dominating men more than being co-heirs. Right? And so that spirit was in that church area. And he said, look, this is not how we do things. This is not the temple of Artemis. And I learned that from N.T. Wright, who's a Greek scholar and a historian, who studied that time period and why he was talking. Because clearly he wasn't telling women they couldn't teach in the church based off of other scriptures. We have Priscilla teaching Apollos. We have all sorts of things. So what was happening? There was a specific temple he's addressing. And he's saying, I do not suffer a wife to be like these temple of Artemis wives. And then he says, but wives will be saved through childbearing. Women don't get pregnant in the church of God. Wives are getting pregnant. Otherwise, a, a person could misconstrue that and go, oh, I need to go get pregnant just from some random guy because look at this text right here. That's not what it's saying. It's saying be married and have children. Why? Because, because of this practice of Eve and all the mothers, right, over time and those who have adopted and all the things and just women in general. But because of their faithfulness and obedience to God, we got the Messiah. Do you understand? A bunch of women had to obey the idea of be fruitful and multiply. Why do you think the world hates be fruitful and multiply? Because God commanded it. Think about this. Why is everybody like, oh, one kid is a burden. That's enough for us. We're all done. We're going to get all sorts of surgery and stop. This world doesn't like children. And so Paul is saying, look, wives are saved through childbearing. How? Because they all obeyed God, you got the Messiah. What if Mary said, you know, I'm really not interested in having a baby, God. Is that the right attitude towards God? What if Eve was like, I don't really want to have babies. Right? And there's that, is there not that attitude in the earth today? There is. 
Women today are being taught that a career is better than motherhood, that a college education is better than motherhood, and they'll sacrifice their own children to have those things instead of have that blessed child from God. That's the current culture we're in right now. That's what he was addressing. Okay, does that make some sense? Study it out. Those words are wife and husband, and that's a different discussion, but those words are wife and husband, not man and woman. Okay, based on the context. Now, what is prophecy or prophesy? Since men and women can both prophesy, what's prophecy? What's prophesying? Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, real quick, verses 26 and 21. Look at this, okay. Paul's talking to the whole church about prophesying. This is men and women. And he says, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Did he just say all? Did he just say each one? What is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble, each one has a what? Psalm, a teaching. Everybody say teaching. teaching. So the same women who are supposed to keep silent also can receive a teaching and teach the church. You're just not making sense. You're doctrinally not being consistent. Clearly, he was talking about husbands and wives because in both Corinthians and Timothy, because here he's telling the whole church, you can have a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. And then he says in verse 31, he says this, for you can all, everybody say all, all. you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may, may be exhorted. You know, he said, brothers and sisters, each one, brothers and sisters. Oh, I see. That's why you don't see it here. Okay. So brethren's very important. There are three different words. There are in the, in the Greek that could be used here. There is a female version, a male version, and then there's a communal men and women. So Adelphos is brothers and sisters. I realize that you don't see it there in the NASB, but it is there. Go study Adelphos. There's three different words. Adelphos is brothers and sisters. Most translations actually put brothers and sisters. For you can all prophesy. So brothers and sisters, you can all prophesy. What does prophesy include? A teaching. So clearly the sisters are allowed to do a teaching as well. Because the spirit is without limit. And when he addresses the chaos later, he's talking about wives who are talking to their husbands and disrupting service. That's all that was. And in 1 Timothy 2, he's talking about a wife and husband dynamic and that the women in that community needed to stop being temple of Artemis. Wives who were ruling their husbands. Now, this is proven by Priscilla. Are you still with me? If you are, say amen. amen. All right, we're almost done. I know. But these are important things. And when you go back and listen to this stuff, you'll get different segments at different times. Acts 18, 24 and 26 says this. Now, a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This is important. Apollos is who? A man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, and he is eloquent. Now, what does it say? This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. So he hadn't actually learned about the gifts of the spirit yet. Clearly, he's a Christian, though. And verse 26 and he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Do you see what happens in this story? Yes. Apollos is a man. He has a thorough knowledge of scriptures. Yep. In other words, he's a preacher. He's bona fide. Yep. And Priscilla, named first, who has a church in her home with her husband takes him aside and it says, explains to him the way of God more accurately. That appears to disagree with 1 Timothy 2, but it doesn't actually. She's not ruling over her husband. She's co-heir next to him. And she's teaching a man because she's enabled by the Spirit of God to be able to teach. It's that simple. And honestly, for those who think that women can't, you have to answer this question. Did Priscilla sin here? 
And I believe that with how often Paul commends Priscilla, he lists her more than three times. He talks about the church in their home. He commends her multiple times and he doesn't rebuke her ever. He does rebuke Peter when Peter was out of line. We literally have Paul rebuking Peter, but we don't have him rebuking Priscilla. Surely we'd have a rebuke of Priscilla or another woman as our proof, as our case study. We wouldn't just have the law. We'd also have examples. But we, in, we actually have examples of women teaching. And not just anybody. Apollos is a learned man. I believe that's why this occurred as well. Because then people start to make the argument, well, maybe brand new men who are brand new Christians. No, this is a learned man. In other words, co-heir, same spirit, able to preach. Amen? Yes. All right. Now, we're going to close with this. Notice that he only knew the baptism of John. See, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. What they went and taught him, I believe, were the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God and some of the other things that he didn't have yet. Though he had a thorough knowledge and he was teaching about Jesus and he was baptizing, he only knew the baptism of John. There was another group that only knew the baptism of John. And let's read about them. Acts 18, 24 through 28. Because I want you to see. And I want you to study uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and 14. 1 Corinthians 13 and 14 are where you're going to learn the gifts. Like tongues of angels, tons of men, prophecy, healings, a number of different things. 1 Corinthians 13 and 14 are your primary texts. Uh, and first, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 12 as well. So read 12, 13, and 14. That's where you really learn about the gifts. Okay? Let's read this about how they're received, and then let's undo cessation, and then we're done. Are you guys good with that? Acts 18, verses 24 through 28. And I appreciate you staying with me. I know that today's been a more theological one, but I think it's important if we're going to operate in the Pentecostal times. Acts 18, 24. This is like Apollos. This was like a group of Apollos's, and we want to see what Paul does here. Acts 18, 24. Now a Jew named Apollos. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, Acts 19. Sorry, we just read his story. Acts 19, 1 through 10. My apologies. Acts 19, 1 through 10. Very next chapter, so just flip over. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, <laughs> Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Notice they're counted as disciples. These are Christians. So when you come across a Baptist or a mainline person who does not operate in the gifts of the Spirit, they are not your enemy. They are disciples. Nobody's treating them like enemies here. Verse 2, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. This is the same baptism that Apollos knew. He only knew John's baptism and he knew the message of Jesus. He did not know the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, but Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who is coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And we know that Peter affirmed that. Peter did the exact same thing, taught that and baptized people. So that's not wrong. We're supposed to keep doing that. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. Now here is the tongues of angels which you see the tongues of angels in 1 Corinthians 13, and then you see it explained in 1 Corinthians 14. It's speaking mysteries. You nor any hearer understands what's being said. Only God knows. That's the tongues of angels. It's not evil. It is biblical. Okay? Then there's tongues of men, which is supernaturally speaking languages. They received these gifts by the laying on of hands. And the reason I wanted to read this is, if you have never had the gifts stirred up in you, we can lay hands on you and pray with you. Because that's what the word of God says. And I remember that when I had let hands laid on me and I had believed and I stopped, you know, I, well, I was a kid. I was a teenager, so I didn't think it was weird in the first place. You might have some doctrines to undo. But if you believe, hands can be laid on you. And I did. I started to speak in the tongues of angels. I'd never done that before. And it was bizarre and odd and different. But I started to speak in the tongues of angels. Still do to this day. It's a private prayer language, essentially, between you and God. I have no problem with it. Um, and uh, I definitely was speaking fluently in a sound and a tongue that I'd never heard before. And I was just a teenager and I, you know, I hadn't like learned other foreign languages or any of that. So I know that it's real and I know that it does occur. And I've seen other things. I've had prophetic words of knowledge. I've experienced, maybe not at the level of the apostles, but I've had these 
tastes and glimpses, and I know that God still does it. And so it's not an evil thing, and it comes by the laying on of hands. Now, for those of you who think there is such a thing as the cessation of these gifts, okay, I think it's very important that we actually read what the scriptures say on it so that we can undo that. 1 Corinthians 13, and we'll, we'll close with this. Okay, first off, verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I ha have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He makes the point that love is the most important thing, not all these powers. And in fact, the powers are so that you can demonstrate love, right? Peter wasn't as powerful. He loved that paralyzed person so much that he'd already given everything away. Yeah. He loved people so much, so he picked them up. So the whole power was a demonstration of love. Even God's power to us today is a demonstration of love. But see, there's tongues of men, tongues of angels. There are two different kinds of supernatural tongues. Just want to make that point. Some people get tripped up because they don't think there is. Okay. Now, verse 8, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. This is the only passage in the whole New Testament that a cessationist can use to try and say that the gifts have ceased. So let's just put that one to rest so that you can receive the gifts, okay? So you don't have a hindrance in the way. I believe this is to be done even with Isaiah 53, that Jesus bore sicknesses and sins. So here, if you're caught up on this, and unfortunately, you know, the Baptists, God bless them, they are Christians, but they teach cessation. Then you've gotten tripped up, and as a result, you're not walking in the gifts. Here's how you get out of that. Okay. Prophecy and tongues and knowledge will cease. Fully affirm what Paul just said here. It's the word of God. It's when and where that matters. And notice what he says. Okay. It, they will be done away. So it was definitely future tense from when he's talking says they will cease, it will be done away. Okay? Yeah. He lists three things, doesn't he? Prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. Boy, they'd have a better argument if knowledge wasn't listed. Unfortunately, for the cessationist false doctrine, knowledge is listed. And I can prove to you knowledge still exists and has not ceased. And if knowledge hasn't ceased because it's combined with the other two, then the other two have not ceased either. And I can testify that they haven't ceased by experience. But here's what I know. Knowledge means that there's a varying level of understanding among human beings. Some people know more than other people. Now, would you agree with me that when we're all in the presence of God, there will be unity of knowledge? That when that perfect comes, there will be a unity and understanding. When you're sitting at the feet of Jesus and we're all learning directly from God at all of us at the same level, in heaven there will be perfect unity of knowledge and of all things. Perfect unity of possessions we're going to share. There's not going to be any poverty in heaven. So there's perfect knowledge in heaven. Is there perfect knowledge here on earth right now? No, there's not. Do you have varying levels of knowledge? Yes. Does Pastor Rick know more than all of you? Yes, he does. Are you paying attention? I'm seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> I'm teasing you. I'm teasing. But there are varying levels of knowledge. And that means that that hasn't passed away. Well, the others haven't passed away either. You're in the same fight as the early church was. You still need that private prayer language to God. You still need to at times supernaturally speak a foreign language. You still need to be able to prophesy over a person knowing a sin that they've committed, convicting them of that sin because you've been given supernatural understanding and that they fall down and go, God is really among you. What must I do? These things, these powers are still necessary because they're still sick people. There's still people that speak foreign languages that we don't know how to speak. There's still people that are committing sins that you need a prophetic word of knowledge about. Jesus did it with the woman at the well. You have five husbands and the one you're with now is not your husband. That was a prophetic word of knowledge. And she says, sir, I see you're a prophet. That's still necessary now as it was then. The perfect hasn't come. Here's the, here's the third proof. So knowledge, and then, of course, we need them. And then here's the third proof, okay? I'll give you three evidences. All right. When you're in heaven, you're all going to speak the same language. There's no need for tongues. You're all going to speak the same language. There's no need for prophecy. All the prophecy has been fulfilled. Nobody's sinning anymore. You don't need a prophetic word about them. And knowledge, you all have unified knowledge and perfect knowledge because you're in the very presence of God Almighty. So these are done away with in heaven, not on earth. Does that make sense? Now, what endures into heaven? That was the point he was making. He wasn't saying there's no more gifts here. What endures into heaven? Love. Love will follow you all the way. 
Your love of God and neighbor will go all the way. You'll keep loving God and neighbor in heaven. That goes all the way. Even when tongues and prophecy and knowledge stops. Amen. Those of you who join us online, thank you very much for joining us. Make sure that you like this video, share it with your friends, and that you subscribe to the channel. We're so grateful. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry, there's a little high heart icon below that you can click and you can give directly on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube or you're here in person, you can give by texting the word GIVE to 386-753-7337. And by texting that phone number, the word GIVE, you can then support the ministry directly. You can also learn about our charity for aged out foster youth where we provide housing for the orphan and you can learn more about that at LegacyHousingProject.org. We love you all online and in person. Thank you for hearing this message.